One more time. Why are there margins? Because, because of Our Lady. She's the queen of margins. We say in the litany, we sang it during this pilgrimage. She's the queen of margins. And strangely enough, she did not shed her blood. Her heart certainly bled when Jesus was suffering. She could not take the crown of thorns from his head when she saw him carrying the cross. Jesus just told her, you stay there, I just walk with you. It's hard on a mother to see her child in great torture and to be able to do nothing. But we see in the stations of the cross, after the fourth station, if Our Lady cannot do anything, you not even wipe his face, she will get other people to do it. That's the motherly wisdom. So she will get Simon to carry the cross, and she will get Veronica to wipe his face. Well, that's why there are martyrs. Our Lady is the Queen of Martyrs. Because she inspired them. As if to say, my children, I was not able to die for my son physically, to shed my blood, to be nailed on a cross, to be burned alive or scourged or drowned in the sea or eaten by wild beasts or die frozen in the snow. I wanted to do all these things. But he said, no, you suffer in your heart, mother. So Our Lady said, you, my children, do what I did not do. And so she has inspired these martyrs to this very day. There may be some martyrs today, somewhere in the world, who die for Christ. Well, Our Lady is behind all of that. She's the queen. Because she's the one who suffered the most in her heart. And she's the one who gives orders, who inspires everyone, even children. There are children who die martyrs. But I would say, greater than the physical martyrdom, Our Lady wants every one of us to do our share of sacrifices. And she asked children at Fatima, the children they know, the story of little Jacinta and Francisco and Lucy. Are you prepared to accept all the sacrifices my son will send you? So there you see the queen of martyrs asking, I'm in heaven now, I cannot suffer in heaven. You on earth continue what is lacking to the passion of my son and to my passion. And that is what is behind the John of Breve and his seven companions. But they're not the only ones. They're canonized. But many others have suffered with them. Many here were beaten and suffered some of the things I will tell you right now. They're not canonized, but they suffer and they shed their blood, many of them. Father Bressani, for example, and Father Shamodou and so many of the others. <laughs> so what we need to take home today from this pilgrimage is to understand, just as when we suffer, a temptation against purity, and we fight. We are fighting for the purity of Our Lady. Just as the devil cannot stay in the Tower of Ivory, she's immaculate. So he will try to get her to her children. That's us. And when he makes us fall, he looks at Our Lady and he says, Look, I cannot get to her. So when we fight any temptations of impurity, we're fighting for Our Lady, to defend the honor of Our Lady. And so when we suffer anything, any sacrifices, we suffer also for Our Lady. Let us then suffer with her as well. 
and with her Immaculate Heart. Let us put our heart in all our little and big sacrifices. The John of Ribbeth and his companions did not become martyrs all of a sudden. Although St. Gabriel Lallemand, who died next to him just a few hours later, he had only been here six months in Canada. That was his first trip, if I'm not mistaken, from Quebec to here. But I would like to make the list partial, obviously. To make the list of many of the suffering St. John Abreva particularly suffered or suffered, but as a preparation for his martyrdom. And you might recognize yourself in some of these sufferings. Any one of us, you'll see, even those in school. We start when he was about 27 years old. He was not yet a priest. He was studying in Rouen, in France. And he got sick. He got sick to the point that he had to stop his studies to become a priest. And he even had an, a breakdown. What kind of breakdown? I don't know, but it was pretty bad. Especially a young man who wants to become a priest, and all of a sudden he cannot even study anymore. Will I ever become a priest? Is it over? What's going to happen with me? First, first trial of St. John, John of Weber. But don't forget, he's a Jesuit. He's not yet a priest. And, having, and being a Jesuit, he has already done the 30-day retreat. He did the 30 days, already once. He's going to do it one more time later. And that 30-day retreat is inspired by Our Lady to St. Ignatius. And many of you have done it. If you do it well, you have also that desire to do something. Jesus suffers for me. What shall I do for him? What is my response to so much love? A year or two later, his superior said, you're, you're recovering fine. You can be ordained priest. So 19, in 1625, he was ordained priest. And he crossed over to Canada. It was not an easy trip. Three months in the boat usually took. And he arrived in Quebec, Quebec City. Not founded for many years, 1608. And we're now 1626. Pretty rough over there. There's maybe 50 people. And his first assignment, when he arrives at the end of the summer of 1626, is to go and spend the winter with the, uh, the Cree Indian, the Montagnais, north of Quebec. That'll be his first discovery of living with the Indians. And we know from other letters of his and from the other missionaries, winter in the forest with the Indians was not fun. A little teepee, as like, you know, the, we have here just right here at the mirror of the Huron, they have samples. The wind goes through it. It's minus 10, minus 20. And they describe, missionaries have described. And so you're, everybody's, well, there's bigger ones and smaller ones, but if you're traveling, it's obviously a small one. And so there's a fire in the middle. And you suffer on one side, you're, you're, you're burnt. Because you want to be so close, it's freezing. The one side of you is being roasted, but your back is being frozen. And you're between being scorched alive and being frozen alive. But they said that was not the worst. The worst was the smoke, ordinary smoke in, in, the, in the, these huts. It was so bad they had to put their face on the ground. It was choking to death. And then they say, you know what else? One of the greatest torture of the missionaries in these days were the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, some of them were so covered with mosquito bites, some of the priests became blind. At least for a while, for a few weeks, they could not see anything. They were like lepers. And you may have seen in some places in Canada, when you get into a cloud of mosquito and you have nothing to protect yourself, they're, they're nasty. These are daily, daily things that these missionaries enter, suffer for us. So 19, the winter of 1626, 1627. 
And then he sent, finally, he sent right here to Euronia to, to open the trail. Why did they come here? Because having analyzed the map of the Indian tribes, they saw that Euronia was in the center of all the various tribes, and if it could convert that tribe, they could make leeway through the other tribes. A bit like our Lord sending Peter to Rome. Convert Rome, and then you open the whole world to Christianity. And so they came here. So St. John came with Father Danue. He came for three years, 26, 27, to uh, late 26, to, 20, to 29. His first discovery of these Indians. Then we have, I don't have time to go into all the details, but you have these 30, 35, 40 days of traveling from Quebec to here. And they recall, and they, in their letters, they say they could be up to 30 portages. And in their canoes, you could put up to 800 pounds of material. Think of that. 12, 15 feet long canoes, 800 pounds and 30 portages. Because there's, there's falls, there's all kind of rapids, have to stop on the side. And the Indians were running, they're bare, don't forget, they're barefoot in the forest. Have to carry every 800 pounds of stuff to sometimes five, six, seven miles away and come back and go back and come back and go back and take the whole canoe and everything. All for the love of God. And what did they have to eat? Plain raw, sometimes raw corn, whatever they had. Whatever, sometimes it's just water they have. These were the trips, all for the love of God. So he was here 16, 26 to 1629, late 26 to 29, and no conversion, nothing. And just as he was about to finally pierce through, he was told by his superiors, go back to Quebec. That's a hardship. When you're, 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 your heart is already there, you're learning the language, you're starting to communicate with them, and some of them are starting to be interested, the superior says, go back to Quebec. And when he got to Quebec, late 29 and then 30, then the English took over Quebec, and they sent all the priests back to France, back to square one. That's a disappointment. You're just starting something and God says, no, go home. Finish. Interruption of the work. That's hard for missionaries. You spend a couple of years over there and finally they come back. The missionaries come back. 1633, they're preparing an expedition with the Indians to come back here. But at the very last minute, the day they're, they're putting things in, in the canoe, the Indians said, no, 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 you're too big. So he's too big. Then John of Ripper was bigger than Father Sherry, you know. And so, and so they said they're afraid that the canoe would sink. And they just left him on the shore and they just took off. But there's only one canoe per year. I have to wait one more year to go. So 1634, now in this second, another expedition. And finally they managed to, to trade, they managed to, to discuss, come on, come on, and and they said, well, they have too much weight, you have too much luggage. No, we don't want these things. And he said, they only took basically their masket to come down here. Even he's so familiar, he wrote a little description, what to do and what not to do in a canoe. <laughs> here. And especially you're a stranger, you have to, you're there in the middle, barefoot, and you're, you're uh, all bent, and you're not allowed to move, or else they're just going to throw you overboard or dump you on the rock or uh, on the shore and just keep going and leave you there. They don't care. So you better be nice to them. And you're not allowed to complain, ever. Not allowed to complain, to keep smiling. It's tough. We can all do that. We don't need to be, uh, to be we don't need to be skin alive to be like St. John of River. Just try not to complain. Already you'll be like him. Then he comes here, 634, 35. It takes a while to, to try to get through. It took uh, St. John of River six years to convert the first healthy man, first adult man, 
who is not dying, who is not a baby, a man, it took six years of preaching. That's long. And so the, the, the appearance that the, the apostle that is barren, I'm here, I'm, I can barely speak the language, but they, and they're laughing at me, they're mocking me, I have no <laughs> compassion at all, no misery for them, no mercy for them. But keep going, keep smiling and keep being nice to them, and don't complain, ever. And so, finally they got the first converts, and they started 36, 37, to make some leeway. In 1640, 1639, they founded the St. Mary's of the Huron. 1640, St. John of Rebeuf with Father Chamonot, the one who founded Loretteville in Quebec, Father Chamonot, great man as well. They're sent to the neutrals, another tribe, another tribe near Niagara Falls. And that was another, another tough five months because the uh, Huron had sent two Indians ahead of the missionaries to tell everybody there, these two black robes coming, they're sorcerers. They work for the devil. Don't welcome them in. And so wherever they went, they were rejected. And it was like this for five long months of winter. And so the missionaries had to eat for fights or, I mean, hunt or whatever for themselves. And on the way back from Niagara Falls, they were crossing a lake at one stage and St. John of Brebeuf slipped on the ice, it was in winter, and he broke his left collarbone. It was so bad that he, he was stayed on the ground for a little while, and then Father Chamonot helped him, help him out. But it's only two years later that he finally con confessed that he had broken the bone. He did not tell, he just, oh, I hurt, I hurt a little bit. And it was so bad that when they had to climb some hills, it's Father Chamonot who says that, Father de Brebeuf had to go on his floor and just crawl on his floor up the hill because he could not walk. It was, it was so painful. Although it was a collarbone, but all kind of problems he had. So you see, but God was preparing him and he would always accept whatever God sent. That's the spirit of the gospel. So, this give you an idea. Read the life of St. John of Brebeuf. We should be very familiar with these things. And I just want to finish with, because I won't go through the martyrdom, it's more, more well known, but I would like to finish with something few of you know, I think. So he died in 1649, March 16, after walking from St. Louis, the little village, we haven't been there, walking from St. Louis to all the way to Ignatius II, where we were this morning. They had stripped him completely naked, walking in the snow, it was freezing in March, about 10 kilometers. He was a, a bit art, art, St. Catherine of Siena of Canada. She was a mystical soul. I've gone through extraordinary, difficult mystical life, fighting with the devil. She was like possessed by the devil, and nobody knew except her, her chaplain. And in 1662, St. John of Brebeuf appeared to her and became her spiritual director for six years. And he would appear to her regularly. And one, in one of the first apparitions in 1663, if I'm not mistaken, St. John of Brebeuf complained to her. He says, God has given me Canada. I'm the God has given me the, the charge of Canada, like to be the protector of Canada. And I have suffered so much for this country, and so few people pray to me. So, I would like to leave you with that thought. Let us go home today and take the resolution of including in our devotion, in our spiritual life, devotion particularly to St. John of Brebeuf, who suffered so much for this land. As you say, not just his blood, he was frozen, he was beaten up, and he was, uh, he broke his bone, he traveled back and forth, I don't know how many times from here to Quebec, back and forth, all these portages, and learning the language, and so on. 
all that he suffered for us, for our ancestors, all those who lived here and those who lived on these lands. So, my dear faithful, let us let us uh, answer the author of the imitation of Christ and tell him you're wrong. Something wrong in the imitation of Christ. What is that? It is said, few people go on pilgrimage and go home better. And so let us make that passage wrong in the sense that we're going to go home better than we have come here today. And we're going to make resolutions not to complain and uh, to offer our little sacrifices and big ones. Some of you may have big health issues, but remember these martyrs, these priests, they also had big health issues. It can be depression, nervous breakdown, you're breaking a bone, you're, you seem to be failing in whatever you do, you fail your exam, you're, you're whatever, you tried so hard and the result is nothing. Well, these missionaries went through all of this. And in that, we can imitate them when it happens to us. So, my dear faithful, let us finish with our Blessed Lady. Ask Our Lady to put in our hearts that fire that she did put in the hearts of these priests, these, these nuns who came across the ocean to save souls. Well, let us have that same fire to save souls, our own first and the souls of those that come our way and all the souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.